If you've deleted your model, hit Control Z a couple times to get the other half of the model back, and then hit Save. A couple of people still have half of their screen showing with the mesh log. There's a little checkbox right down in the bottom right corner that says Logs. You can turn that on and off to get your full window back. Everybody see that? We're going to have a lot of logs that come up. We just shut them off when we don't need them. Now, one of the th main points of today's lecture is going to be that any finite element analysis, the results are only as good as the input. And in this case, that means the results out are only going to be as good as the mesh in. Under mesh, drop down and let's run what are called the mesh statistics. Initially, this portion is simply giving you counts of things. So it says we have about 6,000 triangles. That's a pretty small number, and it's going to run pretty fast, which is good. The computers really start slowing down when this number becomes something like 5 million. Then it takes a while. A couple thousand, it's going to run quick. The number of nodes connecting them. Beams, this is a different type of element that we're going to use for runner systems in about four weeks. This is important, connectivity regions. One, if you bring in your model and it says you have two, three, four connectivity regions, it means that you essentially have four different parts on your screen. And that when you try to fill one, it's not going to fill the other. Does that make sense? When you run an analysis in mold flow, if it's just the part, you want one connectivity region. There will be times in advanced mold flow classes where you'll put cooling lines in and you'll model other stuff other than part and runner geometry where this number can be bigger than one. But for everything you're doing in your projects, it should be one when you actually hit run. The mesh volume and the mesh area. This is important. The mesh volume should resemble what it resembles in SOLIDWORKS. If it doesn't, you probably brought your model in wrong. You probably screwed it up in the file transfer. And the mesh area should resemble the surface area of your model in SOLIDWORKS. Same reason. This edge details is essentially what we were just talking about when we deleted half of our model. If you've paved the entire outside of this model with elements, you should not have any elements that have what's called a free edge, or an edge that isn't joined to another element. Does that make sense? If you think about the simplest analogy of a cube, every side of the cube is touching another side. If you then look at it as a cardboard box, where you've taken off one side and it's open on top, how much volume is enclosed? None. It's open. But you have four free edges on a cardboard box. Make sense? This number better be zero before you go and you start running your model. Manifold edges is essentially any vertex where one element hits another. So every one of these lines right now is a manifold edge. And it's just counting the number of lines. Non-manifold edges is when you have one element here, one element here, oh, and another here, or here, or two more. In a mesh that you're going to do, a surface mesh, you can't have one, two, and three. Does that make sense? That third element would be sticking off into space or sticking down into the part. And I guarantee that all of the models that you generate, you're going to have stuff that's, ooh, that didn't come through as well. And how you bring it through from SOLIDWORKS is going to determine what you get. Not oriented, you want them all oriented. That's, are they pointing up or down? You don't want anything intersecting 
overlapping or duplicating. And if you get problems here, they're also going to show up as problems here. Make sense? That many times if you have an intersection, you also may have a non-manifold edge because they're touching. In this area, the maximum aspect ratio that you're going for, ideally, is about six. Reasonably, mold flow is going to do pretty good on giving you results if it's anywhere between 10 and 12, maximum aspect ratio. 30, it'll run, but you're going to have some interesting results in places that aren't realistic. Aspect ratio is essentially... We have markers. Why do the Mason run my office? I, I apologize. The aspect ratio is how pointy the triangle is. So if you look at these triangles on top of the part, do you see how they're almost equilateral triangles? That's great. The base of any side is going to be very similar to the diagonal or the height of the triangle. That's what you're looking for. That would be an aspect ratio of 1. The pointier and pointier the triangles get, so the longer they get and the shallower they get, the worse the aspect ratio is. And what happens mathematically in mold flow is that as the melt is filling across the triangle, it's going to be averaging what happens and calculating at each individual node. And if you have a very, very long pointy triangle, it's going to do different averaging one direction than it does the other direction. And your results get weird. The other thing is that the math of very, very small angles is difficult. And then finally, we have a match ratio down here. That's saying how many elements on one side are matched to the other, and then how many on the other are matched back. And we'd like this to be in the 90s. So. Very quickly, what I was saying about aspect ratio. Thank you, Andrew. If this length is our base, and this is our height, the aspect ratio is simply equal to the base of the triangle divided by the height. Does that make sense? This number, we want it to be less than 6, ideally. If you can get there, that's great. 10, feasible. So the, the match percentage was the, uh, the matching of the two layers? Is mm -hmm. that so what do we need to look at on our model and fix? <coughs> We need to fix the high aspect ratio and the match, the match percentage. <laughs> Under mesh, drop down to mesh diagnostics, and let's start with an aspect ratio diagnostic. And by default, we're going to show anything over a minimum of six. You guys that have taken it before, remember that this is what makes the model look like it's grown hairs. <laughs> and all of these lines indicate an element that is bad. So if I zoom in, Does everybody see this red line on my screen right here, this long one? I'm going to zoom in on that. Take a look at this element. Do you see how long and narrow that is? 
And then right next to it, another long, very narrow element. Everybody sees that? What's causing those long, narrow elements? It's too skinny. The triangle is too skinny, but what fundamentally about the geometry meant that I had that problem? Okay, it's a sliver surface, and that sliver surface is being caused by a difference in draft. This surface that these elements are on is drafted in to form the core. This surface is drafted out to form the cavity. And right here, we have a draft mismatch. And that draft mismatch is causing this line of sliver elements right up it. Do you also notice that my elements start to look bad wherever I have a round? Anywhere where there's a radius, I have a higher density of blue. Do you see that? Anywhere that I have a radius, I start to see a couple more elements showing up. Let's come under mesh diagnostics and let's look at the dual domain mesh match diagnostic and hit show. Where is it having trouble? Anywhere there's a curve. Anywhere where there's a draft mismatch. So all the fillets, all the draft mismatches. It's doing correctly. It's identifying that the end of this fan is an edge element. And it's identifying that most of these surfaces are matched. But we have a lot of pretty bad geometry in there. Now, what does this bad geometry cause, is the question. OK, this is a pretty picture, but what does it actually do to the analysis? Just mess it up. Yep, it does. And here's how. Come under mesh diagnostics, thickness diagnostic, and hit show. I didn't hit the right one clearly, because I'm showing occurrence numbers. So what this is showing is the perceived thickness of the model. It uses the mesh matching, and it calculates what the thickness of the part should be based on the mesh. mesh. It then assigns a thickness to each element. And that thickness is what's used in the calculations. So the mesh is used to convert it into a math problem. And then the math problem gets solved. And this thickness number is what actually gets fed into that math problem. Make sense? If the thickness is wrong, the math problem comes up with the wrong answer. And if you want to probe some of this and see what you think, see this little um, rainbow with a question mark up at the top that says examine results? Smack that, and then you can probe individual elements. Notice that, for instance, right here, I have a couple of elements that are perceived at a half a millimeter thick, and they're directly adjacent to elements that are two millimeters thick with the top of the part. And that coming through this radius, I have everything from two and a half millimeters to three and a half millimeters to two millimeters, and then you're coming down the side and you're at three, and then you do, because of the draft, go back to two at the base. So the thickness up in this region is really all over the place. And because of that, 
it's going to feed those odd thicknesses in 